our, our next speaker is going to be Jim Teamstra, Director of Pacific Division, who is going to be talking about the Amateur Radio Parity Act. Thanks, Dale, and uh, good, good afternoon, today. everybody. I'm the director of the Pacific Division, as Dale noted, and I'm also the chair of the Legislative Advocacy Committee for the Board of Directors of the League at the moment, which is uh, probably why Dale asked me to say a few words about the Amateur Radio Parity Act and what's happening with it at the League right now. Um, I was thinking about what to say today, and I, I you know, didn't want to come up with any canned remarks or comments. And I sort of decided to rely on what the questions have been that I've received from members because um, we haven't done a good job at publicizing what happened at the end of last year, beginning of this year, uh, the current suspension of our efforts to look at reappraisal of the uh, entire strategy involving um, the Amateur Radio Parity Act. I assume everyone here um, in some way, shape, or form was supportive of the effort that went on for the last three years uh, to try to ameliorate these overly in restrictive CCNRs, private land covenants, conditions, and restrictions that have had an impact on activities of, of amateur radio operators in the United States. And thank you for your efforts in that regard. I am completely cognizant of what that involved. I traveled all over the Pacific Division at the time, spent a great deal of time and effort uh, pulling together signatures, carrying computers and printers and paper and everything to get letters written to congressmen, senators and the like to support the grassroots <coughs> legislative effort that was involved in pursuing the Amateur Radio Parity Act. I really do understand the magnitude of those efforts by all of us and everyone in this room. But at this point, we're not suspending that. We're not going to cut back on our efforts. What we're doing is renewing those efforts, reappraising, and re-energizing our strategy to pursue the Amateur Radio uh, Parity Act's concepts, and that being uh, relief from those restrictions of CCNRs nationwide. It just takes a step back with a new board of directors, a step back and a look at what we've done in the past, what the shortcomings have been, what advantages we've gained from it, which include uh, having a lot more name recognition and actual knowledge about amateur radio being dispensed on Capitol Hill than there has been in, in the past. And we have plenty of friends and sponsors now on the Hill there to help us in our next effort or our continuing efforts in this regard. Unfortunately, the last effort did not lead to ultimate success. And it did become compromised to some extent during the advocacy process. There were negotiations that went on with the national CAI. There were issues that were changed. Um, well, not the issues so much as the language of the bills that were being proposed was changed. And um, although we did uh, raise the awareness of amateur radio and our issues with a bunch of our sympathetic friends and, and supporters in Washington, D.C., um, we didn't get the ultimate prize, which in some respects was a good thing. We found that there were errors, flaws, as I said, in the legislation as it had been compromised. There were people who brought up issues that hadn't been seen by others before. There was some more in-depth analysis being done. And in the end, we realized there were so many concerns that on balance, it might not have been as beneficial to amateur radio as we had initially thought. Well, it certainly wasn't as we had initially thought when it was simply a reflection of the PRB1 um, regulations. So it had to be withdrawn, it has to be reworked, and it has to be renewed and re-energized. Um, <clears throat> we're temporarily suspending those efforts by asking our congressional friends, sponsors, supporters in Washington, D.C. to hold off on the legislation. Uh, at the board meeting in January, we requested that our sponsors go ahead and just do that, and quietly table it for the time being. We also withdrew a, without prejudice to refiling, a proposed notice of rulemaking with the FCC, which had parodied the same uh, 
type of language that was in the Amateur Radio Parity Act. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so we formed a new committee, though, to take over the efforts, the Legislative Advocacy Committee, which I've already mentioned, uh, which I chair. Uh, we got some of the best minds on the subject who have been litigating those issues as volunteer counsel and who are also board members to be on that committee. We've got objectives in mind. We have a schedule of going forward, and that schedule is to move forward rapidly in the near future. We're trying to organize at this very moment a meeting in Washington, D.C. for next month where we'll get together with some of our friends and supporters and talk to them about what are the most effective ways to pursue our objectives. And we're going to talk to not only those supporters, but our lobbyists as well, find out what works and what hasn't worked on Capitol Hill and why, and try to map out some new strategies that'll be the most successful um, that we can possibly pursue. We'll have a luncheon with friends and supporters of the League to solicit their input. And um, we are determined to put together a plan for the future that will be reported to the board this coming July in our semi-annual annual meeting um, in July. And it is our intent that the board this year begin to formulate a strategy again for addressing the needs of the League members which will provide the greatest opportunities for success. Parallel with that, we have members of our committee also working diligently in the state legislatures trying to um, craft similar legislation, which has already begun in the states of, uh, let's see, Texas, New Hampshire, and Maine, all drafted in the last 90 days or so, or 120 days, um, that are being introduced in those state legislatures, and I'm sure there will be others to follow. We're working on a model statute, uh, one that would be uh, appropriate to amateur radio protection uh, and the protection for uh, antenna structures and the like. Are, yeah. You know, reasonable antennas is, uh, is sort of a subjective uh, eye of the beholder kind of um, problem. You know, what is uh, beautiful to us may be a stacked uh, set of uh, step IRs or something like that on a 140-foot tower. Uh, that might not be the same as what a homeowners association might be consider reasonable and effective communications in a, a six inch 440 uh, megahertz whip. So, um, you know, we have to define things carefully and really uh, draft things properly so we know exactly what we want and how to get there and give our local people the tools they need to talk to their homeowners associations their local housing groups and uh, ha be in the best position to convince them that uh, what is being proposed by the ham radio operator is reasonable for their effectiveness and use. In this process we had also developed one reason we didn't spend a lot of time publicizing to the membership a great deal of detail into what we were doing with the Amateur Radio Parity Act and um, other efforts that were going to be begun <coughs> excuse me, was that we had to talk first of all to our sponsors and friends on the Hill. <coughs> and several of us got together and did a, a very detailed memorandum on the ARPA as it currently is drafted and went through some of the deficiencies and difficulties in layman's terms so that our friends and sponsors on the Hill would understand what the issues were. And Virtually universally, um, it was understood when we disseminated that information uh, as to what our problems were, why we had to take a look at it again. And as far as we know, they're still all strongly standing behind our efforts. They have further understanding now of our issues and what's of importance and concern to amateur radio. So that's the highlights of what I have now. I could go into a lot more detail and maybe at the end of today's forum, there'll be a little time for question and questions and answers. I, I thank you very much. Uh, gentleman back there in red. Yeah, I have another question about the Parity Act. 
you know, one of the pillars of our mostly civilized society is the notion of the contract. When I purchased a house in a restricted community, I entered into a contract. <clears throat> what precedent is there for Congress by fiat just suddenly nullifying millions of contracts that were entered into in good faith? I'd like a 200-foot tower as much as the next guy. But I know it's not reasonable for me to beg the government or my government representatives to tear up a contract that the other party entered in good faith. I'd like to answer your question in a little more general terms, and, and maybe it's something you understand a bit better, even though it does have to do with some legal technicalities. There's something fundamentally different about CCNRs than any other contract you typically enter into. Usually you negotiate a contract with the other side. The fundamental principle of contractual agreement is two sides with equal bargaining power coming together and actually reaching a deal because they both have interests they want to accomplish and they have a mutual goal in mind. CCNRs aren't like that. In fact, they're probably the furthest contract away from that concept because they are imposed on the land, a piece of dirt that's there since eternity and will go on till the world ends. And the problem is, the way CCNRs are structured is a developer comes along and a developer creates an overall community plan and all of this, and as part of that, they set up a, a set of rules that they create out of whole cloth on their own. Many of them they've borrowed from other developments that have started, because they're things they think people will generally like to have, and they they cover a whole lot of things, sometimes down to the plants and vegetation you can grow on your lawn. That is different because the homeowner who comes along and purchases a property to build their home on or goes to the developer to buy a lot or goes to the person five owners hence and 25 years later and says, I want to buy your house, has no ability to negotiate that particular uh, item of the contract. There is no ability anymore to negotiate whether or not the CCNR says no antennas because that's running with the land. That contract is recorded in the real property records for time immemorial and it's never going to be negotiable again ever since it got imposed on the land. That's a fundamental legal difference in CCNRs from contracts that you negotiate as a business person, as an individual, as a consumer, as anybody else. And it's something people don't think about <clears throat> when they realize that there are studies, CCNRs have grown exponentially in this country from having very few planned developments uh, only so uh, recently as 25 years ago to today when um, you can get CCNRs. I, I sold a property once that I bought in on contract. I was going to build a house for retirement until I got the CCNRs after I already purchased the lot on contract and they hadn't even provided CCNRs until later in the process and I got a Bible and it went through everything that you're supposed to do and not do and everything else and I said oh I got to get rid of this and I sold it immediately so you really it's really different it's it's not the same kettle of fish it's not really a contract in the way anybody understands negotiated contracts it runs with the land and is a lot of these uh, congressional precedents that Congress has imposed to overrule CCNRs are specifically because they are different than any other contract they can control TV antenna reception and TV antennas so they have to be, allow that now because that's a right the federal government thinks you should have. We all remember the redlining days. I hate to bring that up. But there were racist covenants, conditions, and restrictions that were imposed in CCNRs to prevent various groups of people from owning property in various areas. And we all know about that. It's part of American history as much as we don't want to recognize it. And those were outlawed. And they were outlawed for good reason and they're never going to be imposed again through a CCNR. I suggest to you as I stand here today, yes, Congress can take the action. It has the authority and it has the justification in terms of amateur radio to provide that relief to hams. Thank you.